Greetings, everybody. Uh, this is Richard Lowenberg, and uh, I'm here to host and moderate the Arts and Sciences program uh, on the nature of information. Um, and we have today on our first day of the laser, um, we have a few introductory guests and welcoming guests since uh, in addition to our virtual space, uh, I thought it most appropriate to also um, present the community that's behind doing this whole program uh, and the individuals, give a, a human face, not just to the presenters, but to our partners and to some of the Telluride community that on the ground are able to participate in some of the programming, uh, both online and some things that are happening offline just in the town of Telluride for uh, lots of uh, former friends and, uh, and neighbors uh, as I lived here for 18 years. Um, and so um, I think to begin, uh, and I'll talk more about the program toward the latter part of this Zoom, but uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce um, Andrea Pauly, one of our primary partners in uh, making this little project, this eight day, 12 Zoom program with over 30 participants. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, it'd be wonderful if you, uh, you know, sort of introduce SciArt Santa Fe, Laser Santa Fe, and anything you know is appropriate, the exhibition that's closing today, and so on. So uh, Andrea Polly is connecting from Santa Fe, is that right? Right now, yes. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's so wonderful to see this coming together uh, and such an amazing presentation um, on Zoom being led by uh, Arizona State. Um, so I'm Andrea Poli. I am a professor of uh, art studio and computer science at the University of New Mexico. And I'm also a member of SciArt Santa Fe. Uh, we are an organization that promotes excellence in art and science in that intersection that we call SciArt. And one way we do that is by hosting lasers like these. Uh, so this wonderful series uh, that's been created by Richard Lowenberg uh, is marking um, the end of a month long series of in-person events that we have been co-hosting uh, in Los Alamos, celebrating art and science in the region, um, in the Southwest region. Uh, so our events have brought together our organization in Santa Fe, Asai at Santa Fe, and Santa Fe, of course, being an international center of art and culture, uh, together with Los Alamos Main Street, led by Jacqueline Connolly, who's here on the webinar, I'll speak a little bit, um, we'll, we'll share uh, uh, very soon, um, of course, located in uh, Los Alamos, which is an international center of science and innovation. Uh, we hope very much to continue this co uh, collaboration well into the future. Um, so Los Alamos, uh, as well as being very important to the future, has a very long history. And I'd like to start um, by uh, doing a land acknowledgement. Um, and this land acknowledgement is thanks to the Pajarito Environmental Education Center in Los Alamos. Um, so we'd like to acknowledge that uh, Los Alamos uh, is on, and, and we are on unceded indigenous land. Um, this area was and is home to those uh, that spoke the Tewa, Toa, and Keres languages. And the area also holds significance through trade and migration to the Athabascan speaking people, including the Deneta, um, the, the Navajo people, and the Apache. We acknowledge these peoples, their elders, and future generations, and their past, present, and future uh, ties to this land. So um, now I would love to show a short video of some of the events uh, that we had um, over the past month. Um, can we show that? Ah, great. So the theme of our events uh, this month uh, were, were into the realms of possibility. And we created a, uh, and Jacqueline uh, curated an exhibition of uh, regional uh, artists 
working in art and science at the Fuller Lodge Art Center that uh, you see here. And um, we had, I believe, 13 artists represented working in a variety of uh, different media, uh, but all contemporary work being done today uh, in the region. And Jacqueline will say uh, some more about that. In addition, um, we uh, supported two uh, events, uh, two lasers. Uh, one was a laser talk um, at the Bradbury Museum of Science. And uh, that talk was uh, featuring Mark Nayrink, um, and we'll see this uh, in a second, uh, Colin Barker and Sasha Vom Dorp. Sasha's work is the, um, the colorful prints on the wall as well as the video um, that you see. Uh, then uh, we also supported a performance by, uh, uh, oh, here's, here are the lasers at the Bradbury Science Center. Colin Barker, Mark Nayrink, and Sasha Bumdorp on the behind uh, there. Um, really incredible, amazing, uh, you know, groundbreaking work. Uh, then uh, we were able to support at the uh, Sala Event Center in Los Alamos, uh, artist uh, Brit and uh, Brittany King, um, who's uh, Navajo and Lakota, and gave a performance under her um, uh, alias Magenta, uh, a kind of a live video mixing performance. And then Michael Barnard, who's a filmmaker, um, showed uh, several of films that he had, has created over his many years uh, as a documentary filmmaker uh, focused on uh, art and science. You can go ahead and, and close the uh, video. So before I hand it over to Jacqueline to tell more about the, the uh, real concepts behind uh, what we were doing, uh, I'd like to thank our great partners, um, of course, Los Alamos uh, Main Street, uh, the Sala Events Center, the Fuller Lodge uh, Art Center, and for generous support from uh, the NEA, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts in the US, uh, New Mexico Arts, and from uh, individual donors uh, who want to see art and science thrive. So I would like to, at this point, now hand it over to Jacqueline. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I'm Jacqueline Connolly. I'm the executive director for Los Alamos Main Street and Creative District. And if you're not familiar with Main Street programs, they are at a national level and then individual states will have a state program that accredit individual communities to have these Main Street districts whose goal is to revitalize and um, work on economic development initiatives in their communities, do a lot of um, activity generation, make people feel um, that they live in a in a wonderful community and, and improve overall quality of life. So in New Mexico, it's really special that we have an additional component called the Arts and Culture District. And Los Alamos has that designation as well. And we, we call it Creative District. And part of that was because we knew that so much of our cultural understanding would be found through science because of our rich history. Um, here and, and geologically speaking, going back way before the Manhattan Project. So we know that it's an important aspect of where we are. I think that's really unique and ties in well with this um, conference or summit that you all are attending um, because it's clear that we know that it's, it can be an economic driver, the creative sector. We know that it's important to overall initiatives and research and that the creative thinking process is just an important part of human um, discovery. So um, Andrea and I started working together probably close to a year ago and it was, seemed a really natural fit to say, hey, why are we doing something collaborative during this fantastic event that we do every year and we just hosted, which is our uh, Los Alamos Science Fest. We've been doing it for 17 years and it seemed just very um, important to bring in uh, regional partners like SciArt Santa Fe to begin having more deep conversations about the intersection 
of science and art and what that means for the community. And so through that conversation, we developed a call for entry and received uh, quite a lot of response. And through that, I have come to realize that we have a lot more to say than just this first exhibit that we've done in these first two programs. I think um, it's really key that we continue to build that partnership and we'd like to see uh, more opportunities to bring artists and scientists together or even to support those that have begun developing or have been doing work for a period of time, highlighting those intersections. Um, the exhibit that you saw in the video, we feel quite proud of um, and our community has had a tremendous response to. We've not had an exhibit like that in our community and certainly not in the Fuller Lodge Arts Center, which is a historic building um, and very deeply ingrained in our local community. And we see how important it is to put things together that are cutting edge and that are talking about the topics of our times in this really beautiful uh, way that help people think about these concepts maybe more deeply and maybe even be inspired to produce their own creative work. Um, and as Andrea said, we did really see quite a variety of people working in so many different mediums using AI technologies in order to further develop their digital work or utilizing different kinds of processes, sometimes even uh, generated by the artists themselves, that utilizing the scientific method of some kind to produce really beautiful work uh, or engaging work to really start to think a little bit more deeply. Uh, some of Mark Nureyek's, um pieces are talking about galaxy structure and patterns. And we had folks that work in um, mathematics creating works out of paper that exemplified a mathematical formula. I mean, it was really, really, really engaging work. So we wanted to share all that with you all and to, and to say the intention is to continue that conversation. Uh, I think SciArt, Santa Fe, and Main Street be a, a, an important conversation taking place that we'd like to have happen in next year and then have multiple locations so that Los Alamos, it doesn't all need to be located here that there's conversations like this one that are maybe virtual or what have you, but you've got hopefully exhibit components in other locations as well. And there's a lot of interesting work now that will talk from one location to another. Um, and there's some folks working on some technologies uh, with New Mexico Tech, for example, where we think it would be a great way to bring together um, artists and technology. The only other thing I would want to, to share with you all, and just uh, I think Richard had asked me to speak a little bit to the creative practices going on in Los Alamos. I mean, we've recently completed our first um, large scale public mural. It's quite beautiful. And people are already, it's the way that that has uh, come into our community and changed the space. If you've not been up here, you might not be aware, but there's a lot of um, strip centers because a lot of the development that was done in our community was in the 50s and 70s. And so we have a very neutral color palette all throughout the community and we don't have a lot of engaging kind of thought provoking work. We have some sculpture, which is good, but this is really kind of starting to give us more placemaking opportunities and, and really develop more conversation. Um, and we also have had a better tie-in. So Creative District used to be kind of separate. It was part of the Main Street program, but was considered kind of a separate endeavor. But now statewide, we're seeing this merging in which we completed a little over a year ago ourselves, merging our Creative District more fully with Main Street because we see every initiative that we do should have some sort of creative capacity. So I think it really shows where our community is headed with these things. Um, but those are the notes that I have to speak with with you all today. So I'm looking forward for a great content um, over the course of the next few days. Thank you. And I believe I pass it back to Richard, if that's correct. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, and um, I think we're going to continue to introduce some partners and uh, major participants in this whole effort. And I think before we move to those in Telluride, I'd like to just have, uh, I want to thank Arizona State University and the uh, audiovisual events management team there who have 
uh, stepped in and provided us with a wonderful uh, tech support network uh, that's making this uh, a reality uh, and, uh, and has helped to assure uh, that while I think the content of what uh, goes on over the next week is really going to be special, I, I know that now with our technical capabilities, especially with the help of, uh, of ASU, uh, the audio and video quality will be up to the standards of the content that will be presented. Uh, and I think is if one of if Seth or by if one of the ASU folks just wants to say hello and uh, has anything to say about uh, how how we're working together here. Bayan. Hi everybody, Seth, Seth Levine here for with Arizona State University, and just wanted to say thank you for inviting us to uh, participate in this on the technical side, and we look forward to seeing the rest of the events. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And uh, my audio is still on. Excellent. And uh, in, in relation to that, I also want to present uh, all the way from London, I believe, today, uh, mm -hmm. Christiana. Uh, and and uh, she is involved with uh, Leonardo and the laser program. And uh, Christiana, why don't you... Uh, step in and, and uh, talk a bit about yourself, Leonardo, the laser program, and anything related that makes sense relative to this program. Yes, so, so first of all, uh, on behalf of Leonardo, we would like to welcome you uh, to this marathon of uh, laser talks over like the next uh, eight days. Uh, just to give you actually like a brief overview of the program, it started back in 2008 at Stanford University. And uh, Laser Talks actually is a program of international gatherings that brings artists, scientists, humanists, and technologists together for informal presentations, performances, and conversations with a wider public. Uh, our mission actually is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of a region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunities for community building to over 50 cities and five continents worldwide. Uh, so we believe that uh, by democratizing interdisciplinary discussion, we're actually creating like a creative infra infrastructure for addressing some of our world's most uh, intractable problems. And uh, with that, I would like to welcome you and I look forward to the events uh, over the next days. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Um, I think now um, I'll say a few words about Telluride and why why Telluride? Um, uh, and then we'll introduce some of the local uh, participants here. Um, I lived in Telluride uh, from 1979 to 1996, very involved in the community in a number of ways. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's just a very special place. It's a special place in terms of physical place, a geophysical place. Uh, it's fragile as are most of our environments these days, uh, and yet has a powerful sense of community. Um, and I and some of the others that we're about to meet in a moment have been involved in uh, creating some remarkable programs over many, many years here, uh, international programs, the Telluride. Well, I will mention the Telluride Institute, which was founded exactly 40 years ago. 1984, and that year also uh, the Telluride uh, Telluride Summer Research Center (TSRC), which is now simply called Telluride Science, uh, was also formed 40 years ago. And scientists come here initially in the summertime, and now year-round for working meetings, uh, collegial exchanges, and so on. Uh, and they're a major partner on this program as well. And uh, today turned out not to be uh, convenient. However, a representative of Telluride Science will join us online later in the week uh, and uh, talk a bit about that program. Um, 45 years ago, really the inception for what we're doing right now with this program, 45 years ago, I was in the Bay Area, I visited 
uh, good friends in Telluride and decided uh, I had just gotten some National Endowment for the Arts funding uh, to put on an arts and sciences working meeting uh, originally scheduled for the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Uh, but once I visited uh, my friends Pamela and John, who had moved to Telluride from London, uh, we decided let's hold the arts and sciences program in Telluride. Take everybody out of context to a beautiful place where you can um, be out of academic context and out of any other and talk about art and science while hiking in the mountains or collecting mushrooms or any number of things one does when one's in a remarkable place like this at very high altitude. Uh, and uh, so 45 years ago, 20 individuals were invited and came to Telluride and participated in a 10-day uh, program that was quite productive in that it led to many collaborations afterwards as a result of the program. Uh, uh, some of the people that participated at that time, uh, and some of you uh, watching may know, uh, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz, uh, who are known for Electronic Cafe and their earlier project, Mobile Image, uh, were here. Uh, part of the Mars Viking Imaging, stereoscopic imaging team were here and premiered a film of Mars in 3D with uh, music that had been composed by Michael McNabb at the Stanford AI Computer Music Lab uh, for that film. Um, we had uh, Harold Cohen and his progeny Aaron uh, uh, were part of the program here and, and, and just a host of many others. Um, it really turned out to be wonderful. 45 years ago this past winter, I decided Let's celebrate. Let's not just uh, look back at what we did 45 years ago, but let's look forward. Uh, and what, what is, in my thinking, not being addressed in the wealth of arts, sciences, technology, and society projects that are now increasingly active in the US, especially in Europe. There's some remarkable works going on in Europe. And, and, and in various aspects of Asia and, and, uh, and Australia and South America, et cetera. Um, and part of the reason for this program is also uh, a week from today, uh, next Friday, we're gonna have an open session that talks about what next, not just what are we presenting here that's of interest, but how do we leverage this little program to maybe influence some next steps uh, and to uh, create some next partnerships. Uh, because I think the arts and sciences and technology and society are in desperate need of inspiring our world and our society and our world views. I think we're, uh, like many of us, I'm very concerned about our near future and our current state. Uh, and that's part of the reason for the title of this program, The Nature of Information. Um, really, I'm talking about an ecological whole systems inclusion of our information environment, which is hardly considered when most people talk about ecosystems or ecology. And even if they talk about information, most people talk about it in a very and understand it in a very narrow way, uh, meaning human communication and AI and computing and the internet and verbal speech and exchange, but all living things, all of life senses and communicates at the subcellular level. And as physics, physicists are now uh, learning uh, information, whatever that is, um, uh, Richard Feynman once said, energy, we don't know what that is. And I think the same might be true of information. There's a lot of definitions of information but I, I think of it as an, eco, as an overarching ecosystem, uh, part of our biosphere. Uh, and uh, some people uh, talk about the noosphere, that informational and communications layer that surrounds the earth. Um, but uh, information is one of the primary fundamental uh, aspects of the universe 
energy, information, and then matter. Uh, and yet most of us are not considering our information environment. We're uh, actively playing in that environment. We're manipulating that environment. And uh, we're having some uh, varying responses to our being more and more in tune with the information environment, with the electromagnetic environment, with technologies that augment our limited senses. And um, I think, and the reason for this program is to um, maybe discuss, present example setting works and inspiring uh, understandings of the nature of the information environment, uh, macro to micro, uh, so as to have a better understanding and better applications. My sense is uh, we're not going to be able to address climate change. We're not going to address water issues, economic changes, any number of the so-called grand challenges, unless we also uh, develop a clearer understanding and a, uh, an ecology of mind, as Gregory Bateson referred to it. Um, unless we have a better uh, sense of communication and information uh, in the same way we do of our material world, we are not going to be able to address those material challenges, I, I'm afraid. Uh, and so I think this is a huge subject. We're only touching on little pieces of it. And I hope uh, a lot of people tune into this program over the coming week. I lived in Telluride for a long time. Uh, I wanted to make real community a part of this Zoom program, this laser program, in addition to the virtual aspects. And so uh, right now I wanna introduce a few friends and partners from uh, who are here in Telluride. And I think I will start with a wonderful creative soul, Art Good Times. Art, are you there? I am here. Can you, you hear us? You're, we're, we're getting there. And what I'd like to do before I mute myself is I'd like Art to fill the screen a little more uh, rather than Dan and Art. So if Dan slips aside for a few minutes and we really focus on Art, there we go. Because we love talking heads. <laughs> <laughs> I have been a, a talking gourd for most of my life now. <laughs> so, Go ahead. Art. Oh, yeah. Well, I, this discussion is really important for me because I first came to tell you ride in 79, um, visiting a friend in Placerville. And I came up to tell you ride, which I thought was this podunk mining camp, you know, resort town thing. Um, pretty capitalist, and I was looking for a commune, and uh, and there was this incredible arts and science event going on, and then I got invited to attend something. I was just so impressed that this was going on. But Telluride has always been a place of knowledge and discovery uh, for those of us settler colonials who who come here. Uh, you know, we like to honor the you people whose land this was and whose land was forcibly taken away in 1881. So we realize that relationship and we've made formal apologies from here in San Miguel County. Proud to say the only county in the state to do that. But we need to make, if we're going to have reconciliation, we need to make apologies, have them accepted, and then work on reconciliation, how we can work together. And that's what we're trying to do with the Ute Mountain Ute, the Southern Ute, and the Northern Ute in uh, Utah, all of which were people that lived here before us. Yeah, the, the sciences uh, have always had a perspective here. We don't have a college, so it hasn't been as strong as some places. But we have been able to balance that with a really strong arts program. And uh, we've been doing poetry events for, for oh, 40 years now. And uh, we worked with the Institute to make uh, the Talking Words events happen. And uh, we have national contests. We have regional and uh, local he uh, readings. We, we, we have a poet laureate of the Western Slope. We have a, a county poet laureate. We have all these proje projects and programs going on. So I'm really proud uh, of the way we've incorporated the arts into our community life. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dan from the Institute, who can say much more than I can. But let me give you a little short poem uh, that uh, I had. It's uh, CO2. Ultimately, the air 
is bare sunlight. Where must be found the lyric valuables? <laughs> Excellent. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dan Collins, the president of the Telluride Institute. Thank you so much, Art. It's so great to be on with you today. Um, we've got a, a three of us from the Telluride Institute. Pamela Zoline uh, was one of our founders from 1984, who's joined us uh, on another screen in another place. Art and I are on the back porch of the Il Wilkinson Public Library, which is a wonderful facility right in the center of town. Pam is up on a mesa top, uh, five or six miles out of town. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I just wanted to introduce you to some of the things we do at the Telluride Institute, which is truly an interdisciplinary organization, and it has explored uh, arts and sciences together over the years, and education especially. Uh, my personal uh, relationship with uh, the Institute actually started in 1993 when I was a, a volunteer intern kind of working at Richard's behest on the famous telecommunity. He had gotten a uh, Apple of Tomorrow Grant or something. <laughs> I don't remember what it was called. But anyway, he got funding to really establish one of the first uh, Internet uh, community info zones, it was called, back in uh, 1993. Um, and then I, I didn't even know what the internet was at the time. I mean, this was just incredible. I've come to a town of 8,750 feet altitude to find out what the internet was. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I might just share the, my screen uh, briefly here. And uh, I was going to go to... Um... Hang on, guys. I'm sorry. I don't know if I can do this from in this context. Um it's okay. Let me let me put in the in the message uh, our website, which is um, TellurideInstitute.org, and I invite you to look at uh, all of our many programs. Art mentioned one very important one, Talking Gourds, which is, is focused on poetry, but we also have programs that are looking at uh, watershed education. We introduce students to um, hands-on experiences in the watershed where they're learning about. Uh, a sense of place and discovery of uh, all up and down our 75 mile long San Miguel River. And so we do free programming in the nine schools along the river. Uh, we have a, a very interesting project going right now, uh, uh, spearheaded really by Pam Zoline and her husband, John Lifton. Uh, it's a collection of some 15,000 first edition uh, science fiction books called the Clute Science Fiction Library, which we're just in the process of writing grants for. And so that hopefully is a, a site for uh, speculative speculation and speculative fiction um, for answering, asking and answering tough questions. Uh, so we hope to have a program of artists and scientists and writers coming and in, in residence to work with that collection and help us understand uh, the future. Art, is there other, are there other programs you'd like to highlight? Well, you know, I, I, I was particularly enthralled with our FEN project. We did, we did a science project along with uh, Dr. David Cooper from Colorado State University, uh, a world expert actually on uh, FENs, which are uh, wetlands that are fed from overhead, not underground sources. Uh, although the, sometimes it comes to the underground, it's really a product of the monsoon cycle that we have here in the high Rockies. So we did a wonderful uh, longitudinal study, which is still going on. And it was thanks to the Institute that uh, we took that under our wing when we were looking for people to help uh, help make it go. Of course, I'm mostly associated with the Mushroom Festival. Um, I, I lead the parade. I've been there since the beginning. Uh, I'm a mycophile, not a mycophobe. And uh, uh, these days, uh, I, we're having a great time learning about the incredible world of mushrooms you know, and some of the amazing work being done, not only as edibles or toxins or hallucinogens, but also as remediation, as medicine, uh, as, as construction material. So there's so many interesting aspects to mushrooms. Uh, it's a kind of exploding. We call it a psychedelic renaissance right now. Everybody's interested in the magic mushrooms part. But once you get involved, you realize there's so much more. So it's been going on for 40 some years and we're really proud to be part of the Institute uh, putting that on. 
And that's coming up. It's August 14th through the 18th, and there's still some passes available. You can always come at least on Saturday and join us for the parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's that's a good intro to the Institute, and uh, I, I'm going to be giving a, a talk uh, on Sunday with Jimmy Note, who's a Zuni elder and uh, CEO of the Colorado Plateau Foundation, and we're, we're going to be talking about uh, alternative methods of mapping, bioregionalism and indigenous mapping, and uh, community maps, and counter mapping. <laughs> That's mapping on a counter? I've, <laughs> I've done that before. Uh, I couldn't pay for them, but I could counter them. <laughs> so, Thank Dan, you. you want to hear Pamela Zoline? Pamela, can you, uh, would you uh, be so kind as to uh, give us a few words? Uh, Pamela, as I said, is one of the founding members of the Telluride Institute way back in 1984 and has been really one of our guiding lights all these many years. Um, thank you, Dan and Richard and Art and uh, the elegant ladies who spoke before. Um, it, it's great to welcome you to Telluride. Uh, Telluride is, uh, as people have said already, uh, an extraordinary place, uh, largely, I think, thanks to our geomorphology and our altitude and our um, natural phenomena. Uh, also, then laterally to the human settlements and communities that have made their way here. Um, uh, Telluride is at about 9,000 feet, our valley floor, um, 8,750 exactly, and we're surrounded by 12,000 to 14,000 foot peaks. So we're uh, we're set in a little box canyon um, with these towering peaks around us. And Telluride has managed somehow through its recent um, uh, settle, settlers history uh, to make uh, um, a rather urbane little um, place uh, in the middle of this wilderness. Because if you take the 30,000 foot view and you hover above our region, our whole region, not just Telluride, what you see are vast high altitude forests with tiny bits of human settlement interspersed, uh, which is, uh, I mean, we kind of like it that way. Uh, but it, it it does make for an unusual unusual situation. Um, uh, I think the topic of arts and sciences is very interesting. Um, I think it's very, very interesting to have this conversation uh, amongst people from different places and uh, by... Uh, uh, kind of by implication, the conversation is a bigger conversation. And I've heard some of the speakers already indicate that they see this smaller version of conversation, part of a larger conversation, part of a larger conversation. Um, I think that's that's always been important, of course, as humans have tried to make our way on the planet. But at the, at the present time, I think many of us feel that uh, it's become critical uh, and and because of the forces that we're dealing with, um, the climate crisis forces, the social justice forces, the biodiversity forces, the 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 complicated systems that now seem to be at risk, including the great pumps the that manage the ocean and the population of insects and I mean, fill in the blank. Um, because of that, it seems to me that our our conversation is basically one conversation, that we're all talking about the same thing uh, from this or that or that or that point of view. And because of that, and because of the criticality and the sense of time pressure, um, these conversations have a value and a purpose and a urgency and possibly even a, a sense of, of excitement uh, with a potential for beauty as well as uh, tremendous anxiety. Um, but 
but we are all trying to get around the same campfire uh, or around the same table. Um, so taking off my Telluride hat for a moment, um, my work in the world, as well as the science fiction, uh, as well as, sorry, the Telluride Institute is that I am a science fiction writer and science fiction is, is one of those fields which has always, um, has always crashed together the worlds of arts and sciences uh, because that's, that's where it comes from. Uh, so, uh, you know, our library here, which has 15,000 volumes, uh, almost all in first edition, uh, is, the, is the collection of John Clute, who is an extraordinary science fiction critic and encyclopedist uh, and author. And this is his library collected over a lifetime. And it has some very particular um, attributes, which we will be glad to share with you at another time. Um, but it's thought of by some of us as a refuge for the future and as an engine, as a way to help us future-proof ourselves. And we can imagine, and this is some, a way in which we'd love to be connected with our regional partners, um, a whole region where there's so much science fiction available, where these, not just the scholars and writers library, which we have, which is not a lenders library, but where we have an additional collection, which is a kind of rolling lending library that people can take books out. And if their dog eats them, it's kind of okay because they're not actually cataloged. Uh, we think that the more we are trained and educated to think and speculate about what we're doing, what the implications are, what our future is that we're building, uh, the more the chances are that we'll we'll get at least some of it right. So we very much welcome Richard's wonderful project here and all the creative people who will be coming together uh, around this table and this bonfire. Um, and I look forward very much uh, to these next few days. Thanks. Thank you, Pamela. Um, I actually see that Sa Sarah Landryu is now online with us. Sarah is the director of the Wilkinson Public Library in Telluride, which has become a wonderful partner on this program. It's hosting the public viewing area uh, of this uh, laser series all week. Um, and uh, individuals who, it, rather than sit at home in front of their little laptops, can come into town to the library, sit in a big room with a large projection screen and good audio and view what's going on, uh, ask questions or make comments in the chat mode. Uh, and uh, again, be part of a community-based conversation before and after these uh, uh, short duration lasers. Uh, so Sarah Landerview, please. Hi. Um... I had the wrong camera on, so I'm sitting sideways. But um, thank you, Richard. I just met you for the first time earlier this week. And just a little bit about myself is I've been the director of the library for 11, almost 11 years now, since 2014. And the Wilkinson Public Library will be okay. celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. And we are very pleased to be a part of you know, this seminar on arts and sciences. And like Pam said earlier about her collection, she's got some books that she circulates and sometimes it's okay if a dog chews them. And I would say the same thing for ours. <laughs> ours, ours can be replaced quite easily. Maybe hers can't from her first edition collection. But um, for this event, we're really pleased to just provide the space for the program and the presenters. And I really value the topics and I can't think of a better place than the public library. We value information. And in this day and age, it is increasingly becoming important to have a community hub for information. Even though, you know, it's all on the internet, it's really not. So, um, you know, we're pleased to hear some of the insights and expertise that are going to be shared throughout this program. 
And I hope that the attendees and the presenters are all able to, um, you know, really take something from this. And we're all happy and just thanking you for sharing your expertise. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I want to just make a couple. Of, do we have anybody else to introduce online? I'm not sure. Um, let me see. I do want to say, uh, referencing Art Good Times' uh, talk, and uh, that right now, in terms of uh, uh, mushrooms, it's, we've had a great wet monsoon season that's still going on and uh, bolites and hawk wings and chanterelles and other many other assorted uh, fungi and uh, mushrooms are sprouting at high altitude and uh, it's one of the joys of living here is uh, being part of that little ecosystem and participating in it and uh, the other thing that just to mention um, in 1979, I organized the first arts and sciences program here 45 years ago. In 1992, uh, I was uh, a program director at the Telluride Institute and took responsibility for uh, bringing real reality to a project we called the Info Zone. And uh, through that effort, Telluride became the first rural community in the world with a dedicated internet point of presence. And in, uh, I think a year before Al Gore invented the internet. And uh, by 1994, 95, we had a, uh, a spread spectrum wireless network throughout the community. Uh, IBM had uh, donated a RISC 6000 server to our efforts. Apple Library of Tomorrow program donated public access systems, computers, printers, uh, their first one meg uh, uh, digital camera at that time. Uh, and Telluride really, and, and that actually uh, made it possible for the science programs as much as anything else to continue to exist here in Telluride. They were desperate for connectivity to the world, to their research labs and so on. So we've had a, an ongoing path of community building and uh, example setting, I think, here in Telluride. Uh, I haven't lived here in a long time, but I'm still, uh, well, I'm overjoyed this week being here as people say, welcome home, Richard. Uh, it's just a lovely feeling. I want to now give, uh, in preparation for the next seven days of programming like this, I want to just uh, read off and give people a sense of the programs that are coming up uh, over the next number of days. There this, we have 11 more lasers after this one. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday the 27th, there is a program called, and these uh, schedule and program are on the Arts and Sciences website, uh, where you can also register to uh, view the, the lasers. Uh, and uh, so tomorrow, Saturday, we have a program called Space, Signs, and Signals. Uh, and uh, the, part, the primary participants are Daniela de Paulus, who's based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And Daniela was originally a, uh, a dancer. Uh, oh, we're going to show the screens. Yes, that's helpful. So Daniela was originally a dancer and involved in the arts. And she has uh, become very involved with astronomy and especially radio astronomy. She has her own radio astronomer's license now. She's been working with various observatories in Europe as well as in the US now. And, uh, and has uh, recently undertaken a really fascinating project through the, uh, in partnership and in residence with the SETI Institute in Palo Alto, California. Uh, one of our other presenters later next week is also now involved with the SETI Institute. Uh, we also tomorrow have Dan Goods. Dan uh, is at Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And he's essentially, he's been there quite a long time. Uh, and 
is in charge of their creative programs, their arts, and right now working on some fascinating projects that deal with communication between Earth and space, especially uh, much like the early Voyager, uh, a, a new set of symbols and communication code that's being sent up by a European uh, space uh, system uh, that, that, that's, that he'll talk about tomorrow. Agnes Chavez lives in Taos, New Mexico. She has been in residence at uh, CERN outside of Geneva. She's now this year the uh, guest artist at Fermi Lab outside of Chicago. Uh, and uh, Agnes is an educator and has a, a wonderful uh, presentation prepared. And also uh, sort of unrelated to space and signs and signals, I've included Marton Aros uh, from Budapest, Hungary. And Marton is uh, actually going to be uh, virtually uh, doing a short virtual presentation. He is a curator as well as a filmmaker. And he is, uh, we're, next Thursday, we're gonna be presenting not online, but for the community only, uh, we're gonna show uh, Georgi Kepisch uh, and a film on arts and sciences. Georgi Kepisch uh, founded the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT a long time ago. A lot of remarkable people, some in this program this week, who were uh, students of Kepish's and others uh, at MIT. So that's gonna be a real fascinating one. Also tomorrow, uh, uh, primarily artists uh, on a session. Ken Rinaldo, who I believe is monitoring this talk right now. Ken is based in Ohio, uh, a really multidisciplinary uh, artist, uh, thinker, teacher, uh, and just inspiring individual. So we'll see Ken tomorrow. Andrea Polly, uh, who uh, just welcomed us earlier, will actually present her work tomorrow uh, late afternoon here. Uh, so yeah, everybody has to pay attention to those time zones around the world, wherever you happen to be. And uh, also tomorrow, Sean Brixey, uh, who I met at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT back, uh, oh, uh, more than 25 years ago. Uh, and Sean will uh, be part of tomorrow's session and another one later in the week, next week. Uh, and uh, a really wonderful guest who's been a friend for a number of years now, and that's Ricardo Dalfara. Ricardo's from Buenos Aires. And I'll tell a short story. Um, the Telluride Institute, many years ago, hosted for a few years with Charles Amerkanian from the Bay Area, a program called Composer to Composer. We brought a number of uh, uh, contemporary music composers from around the world, from John Cage to Laurie Anderson to Ricardo Dalfara and many, many others here to tell you right inspired in part by the early arts and sciences program, which brought everybody out to the mountains here, took them out of context, not so much for public presentations, but for working meetings among each other, for shared quiet time uh, to create works rather than just present works. And uh, that program actually led Charles Amerkanian to create the Other Minds Festival which is very active in the Bay Area and has been for quite a while. Ricardo Dalfara uh, teaches at Concordia University in Canada. Uh, and uh, in 1989, I believe the Telluride Institute invited Ricardo to participate, to come to Telluride to participate in uh, Composer to Composer. And uh, Ricardo has told me since that that was, uh, he was a young, young, innovative composer and hadn't really received international uh, invitations yet. And he said, he opened an envelope with an invitation to come to a place he had never heard of. And it was life changing for him in that it was the first time that that kind of envelope and an invitation included a check. <laughs> we paid his way. Uh, Ricardo can tell us more about that tomorrow. Uh, we have on Sunday, 
Jim Enote and Dan Collins. Jim Enote, we're really so pleased and grateful to have Jim Enote uh, on his bio, Zuni Farmer. But Jim is so much more. Uh, he is the uh, leading executive of uh, the Colorado Plateau Foundation and of the Grand Canyon Trust and sits on many other boards and is a person of great influence among the indigenous communities of this region, which is uh, uh, really a diverse and rich uh, cultural set of communities uh, with a, uh, an incredible history uh, that our good times alluded to a little bit. This is Ute territory here. Uh, Zuni is in very Western New Mexico. And so we really look forward to meeting Jim on Sunday and uh, Dan Collins will be joining him for a, a laser also on Sunday. We have a, a remarkable program uh, that has two parts. It's a conversation between two brothers and then a discussion and presentation on photonic futures. Um, not a lot of people realize, well, uh, I'll, I'll back up. Last April, uh, uh, my wife Jane and I were in New York City uh, and uh, I, I had prearranged to meet with uh, Vinod Menon at City University. Vinod is a laser nanophysicist uh, or a nanophotonics physicist. And uh, I, I share a fascination and deep interest especially applied to creative work in photonics, light, photons rather than electrons. And I think a lot of folks don't realize we are moving into both a biogenetic information processing future and a photonic information processing future. Uh, quantum computing is largely going to be uh, underpinned by photonic processing of information using light rather than electrons. And one of the fascinating things to me about that is it can be uh, lasers and photons can be used uh, for sensing the way we've used electronic sensing of things. Uh, but it also portends a new form of logic, uh, digital logic, binary logic, Boolean logic has been, as we know, on, off, either, or, if, then, and unfortunately has been applied to society beyond just uh, being applied to technology. And more and more troubling to me has been that society is thinking in terms of either, or, us, them, good, bad, very black and white, instead of the rich nuances that are reality. And uh, so I think uh, an introduction to photonics and a conversation about it will be really exciting. Also joined by dear friend, August Muth, who is an artist and holographer doing some of the most innovative holographic imaging works uh, that are being done at the moment. Uh, in fact, not just capturing images in three dimensions, but just capturing light, uh, just the, the essential essence of that medium. So that's on Sunday. I don't wanna to take too much time here on this whole program, but uh, on Monday, the, 29th, uh, the 28th, no, Monday the 29th, we have two programs. The first is physics, information, and the origin of life. Uh, and uh, the first person I invited to this arts and sciences program last November was Dr. Uh, David Eric Smith. Uh, and I met David Eric Smith, known as Eric. Uh, I met him at the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, where I live. Uh, and uh, Santa Fe Institute is the home of complexity sciences and a, a remarkable scientific institution uh, of global status with Nobel laureates, Nobel laureates uh, in residence there, as well as postgraduate students from around the world and many others. 
uh, remarkable work going on. Eric Smith is a physicist working at the origin of life. At what point does inanimate matter be, did in, inanimate matter become life? And in what way? It's very speculative. It's not clear yet exactly, but there's a lot of work. And Eric is a remarkably clear and succinct communicator uh, about difficult science. And I really look forward to Eric's uh, talk with us. He's joined by Edwin Valentin from Göttingen in the Netherlands. And Edwin Valentin is also a, 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 an astrophysicist. He is an AI researcher and a computer scientist uh, already in his 70s. Uh, he founded a major planetarium in uh, Göttingen and uh, every two years holds a, a, a program much more uh, scientifically oriented than this particular program uh, that deals with information and it's called the Information Universe Conference. And Eric Smith has presented there in the past and uh, Edwin Valentin will join us for that, as well as a young uh, astro uh, cosmologist, astrophysicist, who was part of the uh, art science show that Andrea talked about that's just coming to an end in Los Alamos. Uh, Mark Nayrink, uh, scientist, uh, is, will present some work on uh, his uh, unique research in uh, cosmology. Uh, and I think that's going to be exciting. On Monday, later in the day, we have a program that I've just generally called Artful Intelligence, my uh, term for AI, ideally. Uh, and uh, Sean Brixey, who we have met a few days earlier, will give a, a more detailed presentation. And he'll, he's going to be joined uh, by Joshua Garland from Arizona State University, who's a researcher dealing with uh, issues of uh, misinformation and disinformation and information warfare and some of the real troubling areas of our information environment today. He's doing research on that, some of it largely funded by DARPA, the Defense Department here, uh, of course. Uh, and so that'll be uh, another view of our information environment. Uh, on Tuesday the 30th, a wonderful program, The Sounds and Senses of Life. There's currently a lot of wonderful work going on by many people uh, who are building their own small Arduino or other kinds of do-it-yourself electronics. Uh, I've been trying to do the same thing with photonics now, uh, but Tim Collins and Reiko Goto, who are based in Scotland uh, and used to be at Carnegie Mellon University in the past. And uh, uh, they are just currently, as we speak, uh, presenting and doing work, some of the most interesting and contemporary work with plant sensing, plant monitoring, and conversion of plant uh, bio signals of various sorts into anal uh, an analyzed and sonified output. Uh, should be really fascinating. Uh, also working in that same realm is Scott Kildall in San Francisco, who's also been doing some uh, just beautiful, most current, uh, uh, Scott's a remarkable technologist, builds his own uh, systems and, uh, and recently has been working down in Joshua Tree monitoring uh, yes. okay. I'm other plants. And uh, Scott also is doing some work now monitoring and sonifying fungal uh, communications and information. They're joined by Ken Rinaldo again, who will uh, be presenting in that uh, realm of activity. Uh, he's done quite a bit. And, uh, and finally, also part of that group, a young man named Matteo Rini is part of an arts and sciences group in Brooklyn, New York. Matteo originally from Italy. Uh, and he's part of, he's a, a musician, 
a remarkable uh, guitar performer, and uh, he is the editor of uh, the American Physical Society's Physics Magazine. Matteo is a physicist and a science journalist, in addition to being a musician. So, uh, and he's going to talk about some of the new AI applications to animal and plant and other biotic communications that's uh, uh, being undertaken as we speak. Uh, then uh, on Wednesday the 31st, uh, a program on ecological economics of information. Uh, the information environment really ought to provoke us to think differently about our economic systems as many other factors should uh, give us uh, reason to reconsider and develop other ways to apply understandings of value and exchange and, uh, and uh, especially uh, in relationship to things like information or learning or health, which are all considered intangibles and externalities in our US uh, economic, political economic system. And in fact, many years ago at the Department of Commerce, at uh, the dawning of the internet age, I went to a meeting that where uh, it was decided, oh, information is property. We don't have to rethink, uh, we don't have to rethink uh, value or copyright or patents. Uh, uh, and I think that's a terrible misdirection and uh, our presenters are going to are really diverse. Rafael Arar, also on the board of Leonardo, uh, is based in Portland. He's working on uh, uh, something called One Project these days that he'll describe. Uh, Jaromil Denis Royal is based just outside of Amsterdam, and has been working uh, with new uh, understandings of value and uh, digital currencies and a means of exchange and valuation uh, should be really a fascinating presentation. And they're joined by Vangelis Papadimitropoulos, uh, who's based in Athens and has been doing some really remarkable work uh, addressing the economics uh, of information within the larger understanding of information as a commons. Uh, applying the work of Eleanor Ostrom and others uh, in attempting to understand and, uh, and look at how to manage, how to govern, how to apply uh, understandings of uh, not just private property and private space or public property and public space, but common shared space, our information environment, at least in part, might want to, might be appropriately considered a commons rather than uh, in, in the ways it's now understood. Uh, an environment where we all share learning, where we all share uh, uh, eco-mindedness and a application of that within the information environment. I just want to actually say I've been in touch with uh, some leading uh, AI and computer science researchers in Beijing and China, and they, uh, as they are developing AI programs now, are really looking for a paradigm change, as they're calling for it, and applying ecological understandings to our development of AI, a very different approach than that which is being taken here. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually quite fascinated. If, if we could arrange the communication, maybe in a future laser, we will do so. I think the Chinese approach, uh, approach to AI may be really very revealing. Uh, then on uh, Wednesday, the 31st, very special uh, connection uh, with SIGGRAPH, the special interest group in computer graphics, which is happening in Denver concurrently with this, this arts and sciences program. Uh, it is a huge program. It's celebrating, I think it's 51st year uh, this, uh, this month, uh, this coming week. Uh, and so we're gonna have a, a special two hour laser with some guests at SIGGRAPH, including Everardo Reyes, uh, 
originally from Mexico, based in Paris, teaching at the Sorbonne, and very involved in computer graphics and computer graphics uh, higher education. Uh, we're really honored to have Tamiko Thiel, who is this year's Lifetime Achievement Award winner in computer graphics, AR, VR, XR, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she will be joining us. Uh, uh, I think will be a wonderful short presentation. Gustavo Rincon, who's at University of California, Santa Barbara, and is touching on many areas of information computing and our physical environments, architecture and environmental design. Uh, how do we create spaces that are more appropriate to our uh, learning environments, essentially, and, and decision-making environments? Uh, and finally, on that program from SIGGRAPH, Helen Nicole Costas, uh, who prefers to be known as Eleni. Uh, she's going to be connecting uh, from Denver, from SIGGRAPH. She, Helen Nicole, or Eleni, is... Uh, the director of the NAS, NASA and other partners, uh, Earth Imaging Laboratory uh, outside of Washington, DC. And they have some initiatives where they're trying to provide uh, next generation Earth imaging uh, data and imagery and information for all sorts of environmental uh, decision-making, whether it's climate, or migration or watershed work or anything. So Helen uh, or Eleni will have, I think, a really inspiring presentation and some possible future opportunities uh, being presented. Uh, on Thursday, the 1st of August, a really interesting little program. Uh, three presenters, uh, Ali Akbar Mehta, based in Helsinki at the Alvar Alto University, and Ines Montalbao, originally from Portugal, uh, also in Helsinki at the Alvar Alto University, and currently, uh, in fact, this week at the SETI Institute in Palo Alto, uh, and uh, Colin Greer. Colin is uh, uh, a retired professor, although he's very active. He's a professor. He's involved with poetry, with theater, with human rights, uh, and so many important aspects of human involvement. Uh, all three of those people are involved with a group called Artists with Evidence, uh, uh, taking a, a, a creative but very deeply uh, sensitive look at uh, conflict in the world, genetic uh, uh, conflict, uh, warfare, uh, migration, all sorts of uh, issues that trouble our world right now. With uh, So artists with evidence are going to be meeting with a friend of mine uh, who happens to be in Albuquerque or Santa Fe at the moment, uh, who lives ordinarily in Cameroon, and his name is Issa Niafaga. Issa is one of the most inspiring individuals I've ever met. He has a remarkable story to tell. He is an cartoonist. Uh, his version of cartoonist. Uh, Issa was a political cartoonist and uh, uh, he has some stories to tell about uh, some of the consequences of his, uh, his art and information presentation. So stay tuned for that. And finally, on Friday, the 2nd of August, uh, our last laser, and uh, I'm calling that the Information Commons. It's an open session for our presenters and maybe a few extra guests uh, that haven't been announced yet uh, to really talk about almost anything that seems current, vital, and worth discussing further, as well as a possible discussion about next steps for the arts and sciences. I think it's important not to just, uh, at the end of this uh, eight-day program, congratulate ourselves on a, uh, a fascinating program, but to really look forward and, and think about and set up a, a means of addressing what next. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a really enjoyable discussion. 
and I look forward to what comes out of that. So that's uh, the program of lasers. We have a few programs that are happening just in Telluride. Uh, Jim Enote, Zuni, uh, will be giving the keynote address at the Telluride Institute's 40th anniversary celebration and fundraising event at the Opera House here in Telluride, the Sheridan Opera House. Jim will doing, be doing a keynote. He and I will also be doing a radio interview on KOTO Radio uh, at noon on Monday, July 29th. And uh, you can uh, tune in to KOTO Radio online and possibly listen to that. You don't have to be local. Uh, on Tuesday the 30th in the early evening, I'm actually the guest presenter at the Telluride Science Organization's uh, weekly summertime town talk. And I'm gonna be talking about the nature of information uh, more from a scientific point of view, even though I'm an artist. Uh, easy to call oneself an artist. There's no peer review uh, and no criteria for uh, quality, but uh, some of us are motivated by uh, creative urges with an underlying sense of responsibility to our circumstances and society. Finally, on Thursday, August 1st, in the early evening, we're having here in Telluride at the library, a free public screening of Georgi Kepish, Interthinking Art and Science, a 90 minute film by Martin Oroz uh, about Georgi Kepish, uh, the founder of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, uh, actually bringing to America in the post-war years, uh, uh, some of what we learned at the Bauhaus and from other European institutions working in uh, the pre-war years uh, or the interwar years of the 20th century uh, in areas of art, science, design, and uh, social responsibility. That's going to be, uh, in, uh, we're also gonna show a short four minute film by Ken Rinaldo called Signs, very appropriate. So that's our, Eight day program, 12 Zooms, over 30 participants. I hope a lot of people join us. And uh, if there's anybody on this session right now uh, that wants to say some final remarks, please. Anybody, Dan, Art, Pamela, et cetera. All right, if that's the case, we will wind up this session for now. Uh, and uh, I'll just mention for, uh, again, logistics, uh, our sessions, uh, uh, the program is on the website. You can download uh, a printable PDF. Uh, there's other information on the website, short bios of everybody. So go to the Arts and Sciences website, uh, and uh, which you should know, uh, should have on various material you've uh, gotten online. And... Um, Let's see, um, I think that's about it. Oh, our, 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 our lasers will start ideally 10 minutes after the hour. So if they're scheduled for two o'clock, they start at 2.10. Today we started a little late, it was the first one and a few little technical glitches. Uh, let's hope for not too many technical glitches uh, and a really rich program uh, about an hour and a half within a two hour window that we have for 12 of these over the next uh, today and uh, next seven days. So thank you Richard. all. Richard? Yes, please. Hi, Richard, it's Pamela. Um, I wanted to thank you and thank everybody for this uh, very good start. Uh, I wanted to say that I think it's particularly challenging uh, for all of us to think about the nature of information and the ecology of information because it's a little bit like asking fish to think about water. Um, and I think that um, as we move to talk about the commons uh, of information, I would suggest that we endeavor to be able to articulate 
some sense of the comedy of the commons uh, as distinct from what is often talked about as the tragedy of the commons. There we go. Uh, I urge uh, all of us uh, presenting as well as our audience to think of these kinds of programs as theater. Uh, we wanna be inspiring. We wanna be a set of individuals that are uh, playing uh, our part in a larger uh, comedy and tragedy that is real life uh, and uh, that we have some fun with it. Uh, so uh, we look forward to uh, inspiring, example setting, uh, personalities, presentations, and public participation. Thank you all. Thank you. Can I, can I add something? Uh, first of all, thank you for bringing everything together. And also I would like to add like a practical uh, element. So we are going to record all the talks and they're going to be published on the uh, Sci Art Santa Fe and Leonardo YouTube channels. So if you miss some sessions, you can follow them up like later uh, through our YouTube channels. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christiana. Uh, and I'll just, I, I had forgotten, but yes, please uh, stay tuned and watch some of these. If you can't make the live streaming, these will all be posted on the SciArt Santa Fe YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll, uh, through various means, remind you of that. Thank you. Thanks.